Uh, so first, thanks to Pavel for amazing opening to my speech. There we go. Uh, last year, uh, I was standing here talking about something which I really like, something which I love, something which I do have a big passion for, about the huge landscapes we are creating at Bohemia Interactive. Today, I would like to talk about topic which is a bit narrower, it's part of the big thing, but I think that it's something quite unusual in the game development pipelines to use the geographic data. So let me welcome you to my talk and thanks for coming and let's get on to it. Well, uh, most of you may already know me, but uh, I'm the guy who one day started modding Operation Flashpoint to eventually become a creative director at Bohemia Interactive. But through my decade or more than a decade in the company, I've always meddled around the terrains. Uh, I was always involved in the development of tools and my biggest pride is my participation in the development of the Arma series, which terrain was also used in the DAISY and like last Last terrain I de developed was for the Argo game. And today, I would like to talk about the big worlds of our games and how the geodata gets translated to, uh, to the actual gaming terrains. Uh, maybe uh, you will find it interesting enough to start experimenting with, with these data as well. And if you would really take a look at that later, maybe after this lecture, maybe in your uh, development career, I would be only glad. And uh, really, it's something you can do. So, uh, why do we need such a big worlds? Come on, in Arma, you can walk. Of course you can walk. You can fly in the helicopter. You can drive various vehicles. You can actually see the sign on the on the right, and the, and it says Galati two kilometers, just to give you some idea of the scale of our terrains. You can ride some advanced military vehicles, even tanks, and you can even fly the aircraft or jump out of them. And of course, last but not least, you can also dive underwater. And of course you can meet some even stranger contraptions. Uh, this is not part of Vanilla game. <laughs> it's a community thing. In Daisy, it's a very different game, but it's the game which is still based on exploration, and the big terrain is a huge part of your experience, which otherwise consists of tourism, something more extreme like getting eaten by the zombies or being executed by the fellow players. All right, uh, the big worlds is something which definitely support our gameplay. And in order to make them truly big and authentic, we need to employ everything we can. Uh, just to give you an idea about the scale we are talking about, this is the terrain of Arma 3. We call it Altis and it's really huge. But it's not just huge, it contains lots of places, lots of locations uh, in really good detail, including some, you know, uh, beach umbrellas and stuff, parcels. But we don't need just big worlds. We also need them to be understandable for the player. A uh, player should not be just released and get totally lost. So that's why we are trying to keep the realistic topology, the correctness of the landscape, how things are connected and why. So major roads are connecting major cities. Small roads are connecting villages. Power lines go from the power plants to the places of consumption. So if you meet a power line in Daisy, you can follow it and you can bet that you reach some location. So this is something which is also important part of what we are trying to give to players, to give them world they can understand, they can know. And 
if you make it the same as the world they know from reality, you are helping them a lot. And of course, reality. That's our inspiration. Like, this beautiful landscape is what you can actually see in Chernobyl, in Armatu, or in Daisy. Uh, but it's not just inspiration. We can directly take the data which describe these landscapes and transfer them to the game. Be it Chernobyl or, for example, Fiji. We've been there as well. Uh, if you look at the geographic data which describe the landscape, it's pretty easy. You have some terrain, so you have some elevation, you can photograph the landscape from above and you get some imagery. Uh, then you have some topographic features, you can abstract what you see to the road networks and stuff, you can have various infrastructure and usually also in the practice, these data are organized in simple layers. So whenever you would start working with the geographic information system, aka GIS, you will be using logic similar to the one you know from Photoshop. And this is how abstraction of the landscape looks. It's in the same time, it's a good example of the application of the geoinformatics. You just have the topographic map. You all use them. So, but of course the geodata can come in much more complex uh, forms like the digital surface models textured by the uh, orthophotography, uh, lots of databases. Uh, all these information share one important trait. These informations are spatial, so basically a map of sorts. And apologies. And this is first example of the kind of data we use. We use the elevation model, which is being textured by aerial photography in this case. Another good example of geographic data is this. A point, a line, and a polygon. It doesn't look like anything too fancy, right? But using these simple features, you can describe whatever you want on the landscape. And vector data are actually something which is pr pretty big for us. Uh, because contrary to, for example, raster data, satellite imagery, they are quite small and they are easy to work with. And this is how these vectors usually look like in reality. This is an example of the data we've purchased for our experimental terrain. I'll be showing some pictures of how we deal with the data sets like this. Uh, for those of you who are geoinformatics freaks, we are using S3 shapefile. It's a pretty commonly known format, which uh, is also easy to process in various open source tools. Uh, for the imagery, we use uh, simply text image file formats and terrain. Our terrains can be edited in Notepad. We use SCDMs. All right. Now that we know that there are some data describing the real world, the question is where to get them. And it's again pretty simple, or it seems pretty simple. You can download them, definitely. Like there are tons of geo databases free available on the internet. Uh, but it also has its downsides. You can buy them, and of course, you can create your own if you need. So, uh, this is example of OpenStreetMap. Maybe some of you are using it. It's a, a community, let's say, open source mapping project, um, which is like a free alternative to Google Maps or a similar national uh, national. Uh, map servers. Uh, the big downside of these community uh, uh, servers or community project is that uh, they may not be entirely accurate because there, there are no, there's no curation, there's uh, uh, no governing body. Uh, like, of course, it's self-organizing, but uh, you can easily miss a forest or town uh, in, a, in a maps like this. Czech Republic has a really good coverage but there are places where there is virtually nothing. 
Of course, uh, you can also download a lot of data from NASA, and we are uh, we are using, the, uh, for example, their uh, their digital elevation models, their terrain meshes for the prototyping. We are particularly fond of the Asterdam, and this is how it looks like. Of course, you can go to more detail, but uh, the biggest downside of these free data is that they are very low resolution. So. If you happen to work on a flying simulator, it's perfect. If you are trying to make a game in which uh, you need to hide in some ditch to cover yourself from the fire or uh, escape from zombies, this is not enough. Uh, regarding the imagery, there are plenty of satellites circling overhead and they are just feeding the companies, they're running them with information, with the imagery, and uh, you can buy them. We did that too. Uh, if you look at Google Earth, uh, this is the area of Cologne, Western Germany, uh, and uh, on Google, Google Earth you can turn on the layer show or layers showing the coverage of various uh, imaging services, and it's a mess, so you can really get the data of the shell if you would need some chunk of real life landscape. Or, as we do, uh, we often ask some small company to provide us with their own data. So, uh, in this case, uh, we are cooperating with a Czech company named Topgis. They have a really nice registration on their aircraft, the GIS. Uh, or, ultimately, if everything else fails, you can vectorize stuff yourself in some open source GIS doesn't really matter. So in this case, uh, the, this is a sample of my work. I, uh, I had to add some forests to, uh, to Chernus when we were preparing the huge update of the northern areas. Previously there was nothing there, just you know, some terrain, some molds. And we uh, pasted in some real life data and with them we wanted some nice forests. So, it took me like five days to vectorize it all, including uh, assigning the values so that we could generate the forests, to which I'm going to get later. There are also some legal considerations to the using of data. When we are buying the stuff we are going to use in our commercial products, we are very careful about the licensing, especially looking into uh, whether we can do the remixes, under which conditions we can publish them, and uh, uh, we always need to have the worldwide license. Uh, some providers require attribution, so it's uh, it's especially the case of the big companies w which are selling the uh, selling the uh, satellite imagery data. Uh, and when we get all the data, uh, we can process them in the GIS geoinformatics system. Uh, there are many tools. We are using the industry standard called, called ArcGIS 10, developed by the ESRI, American company, and it comes with all kinds of uh, uh, modules and additions. It's not cheap, but it's very reliable. But, of course, uh, other colleagues who are not as lucky as me, they don't have the license, they are using Quantum GIS, and another good option is definitely Grass GIS. So, if you would like to give it a go for yourselves, these two systems are probably a good start. Uh, once we have the data, uh, we have to process them into the form in which they are usable in game. And uh, we have this tiny contraption of a tool. Uh, it has no preview, it's nothing fancy. Uh, it just loads geographic data and flushes out the files which we are able to import to our tools. Uh, for some reason, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, this is the overview of our pipeline, which involves the processing of geodata by the GIS including some one-trick ponies, as we call them. There are some tools which are simply good for one thing. Uh, it can be some nasty conversion, which is, can, can be quite exotic. Uh, it can be shifting or rotating the data or reprojecting them. Or we are feeding them directly to terrain processor. And once we get the source data, we either use them directly in the game or process them in our 
uh, world building suit which we call Terrain Builder. Uh, and when we start working on a terrain and we choose some nice area like this, we start by cutting out a suitable part of terrain. So uh, uh, you've already seen this image. This time there's some information about the size. And this is how it looks like, like the current, uh, cu current terrain mesh of the, uh, uh, of the experimental terrain. Uh, then we manually edit it, uh, especially in this case of the landlocked area. We decided that it would be it would be nice to have some hills uh, uh, on uh, on the places where there would be otherwise some uh, flatland. So uh, red areas are higher than the original, blue areas are lower. As you can notice, we decided to add a little river. So uh, the river bed is uh, modeled semi manually in a little one-trick pony called L3DT, a large 3D terrain, a very nice utility. And when we have the terrain, we map some imagery on it. Can be satellite imagery. We colloquially call it sat texture, but mostly we use the orthophotography, the uh, pictures taken from the aircraft glued together by some clever algorithms. And so this is how the original looks. And these are the data which we use in the game. Uh, naturally, uh, we are adapting the landscape. It's really cool to have the topology. It's great, but sometimes you need to alter it. Or, you know, in this case, we were adding forests so that we can block some uh, lines of sights because in our games, you are fighting with tank on two to three kilometers. So sometimes you need some convenient hill or forest to, uh, to cover your objective. So in order to make the landscape less open and more interesting, we made some changes, as you see. Uh, of course, sometimes we do even more uh, visible changes, like adding uh, airfield to one of our Arma 3 terrains. And uh, when the terrain is ready, we move to the road network. Road network, it's the only data our game or our engine in case of Arma is using directly, drawing, uh, drawing models based directly on the shape files. Uh, on Altis, we had 800 kilometers of roads. Uh, in the previous versions of our engine, when I started working in the company, we were building roads using 10 to 25 meter long chunks. 25 meters. I didn't even make the calculation for this, but it was insane. So we soon started looking into automating those processes. And uh, I would say that right now for Arma, we are in pretty good shape. Uh, this is road network of our experimental terrain. Uh, and uh, of course, it cannot get to the game untouched. Well, it can, but it could cause some issues. The red parts uh, were either removed or edited so that we get the road network which is much simpler and more understandable for our artificial intelligence. Arma supports tens or hundreds of AI entities, some of them driving vehicles. So uh, having a, a, a good terrain data is also important for this. So if you start confusing artificial intelligence, they start doing crazy things and then you are facing all those funny videos on the internet and uh, you think like, oh my God, like we should have done a lot better. Uh, so uh, after some experience, uh, several games released with this technology, uh, I, I dare say that we finally know what we're doing. And uh, we are doing it pretty well, actually. So this is one of the uh, roads which is based on the vector data. And uh, we also support various types of roads. So you can have one shapefile, one layer of uh, roads. And some of them can be forest roads, some of them can be main roads, some are just you know, regular paved ones. And uh, to make the roads complete, we need to uh, do one final step usually, because when you, when you buy your uh, terrain, it's usually missing these funny lines. 
These funny lines are created also by our tools, which load the road network and original terrain and flattens it under the roads themselves, which is definitely helpful for both AI and players. Uh, but, you know, terrain, it's not just mesh, unless you are dealing with the flying simulators, of course. Uh, it's not just a road network. Uh, there are plenty of features in the landscape, and a lot of them are represented by the object, object instances. And uh, in the big landscapes, you have a lot of object instances. As you can see, try to count the trees, try to count the electricity poles, try to count those houses. You would arrive to the numbers in the level of hundreds or thousands. So it's, I would say, beyond the capability of simple manual work. Uh, and as we have these data, when you look at them, they perfectly describe various land cover. So how the landscape is covered by objects, let's say, or uh, what's on it. So we have forests of various kinds. We have urbanized areas, which can be tricky. Uh, and we have some other, uh, other things like uh, ponds, which we unfortunately can't do really well yet. And uh, uh, this is how we deal with the shape files. Again, vector representation of the forest can be filled by the, uh, by the objects automatically. And this is what we do. The, the forests we make are uh, usually support the uh, density of objects in a, like a 10 to 20,000 uh, objects per kilometer, which translates to something like 100 to 200 uh, trees per hectare, which is only slight, slightly smaller amount compared to the real life. And thanks to our tools, in a matter of seconds, we are able to fill our maps with more than two million objects. Two million objects. Uh, if I would force some of my colleagues to do it by hand, they would probably end up spending weeks on it, copy-pasting parts of forest or uh, begging somebody to write some scripts for them. Uh, and uh, uh, we would have trouble uh, doing the iterations. Uh, our tools are rigged so that this is just one single layer we can turn on and off and we can throw it away and regenerate in a matter of seconds. So uh, it's very helpful. In case of uh, Tanoa, it, uh, it was a slightly smaller amount. Uh, Tanoa is our Fiji-inspired terrain, uh, uh, which is featured in, in Arma 3's Apex DLC, and it's all jungle. And I'm particularly proud on the work of my colleagues who created these jungles using terrain processor automatically. And, uh, well, uh, when you are talking about some wild place, uh, you are talking about that there was no human before, no human set foot on it. So in the case of these jungles, no terrain designer set their hands on it. And uh, uh, it's still okay for the release. We, uh, of course, we are editing the vector data as well. So this is one tiny example. We are adding clearings, partly because it makes the forest more interesting, partly because it's saving us object instances. You can load the terrain faster, why not? And this is the am amount of the clearings we have added to our experimental terrain as part of uh, the uh, performance optimizations, which are still ongoing. And when I was showing you the picture of the jungle, I was mentioning that the, it, it really resembles the natural thing. And uh, we also have tools for this. You know, you can't just stick trees randomly into the terrain. No way. They have some very complicated ecological relationships, uh, how they grow. There are, there are like tons of things which are involved in the process. Uh, it usually translates in uh, uh, the vegetation being clustered. So uh, even for the high density uh, terrains, this is the real thing. Forests close to Bernal, 
mixing spruce and beech. And this is the pattern we've achieved in our experimental terrain. Again, beech uh, has a smaller percentage in the forest and it's clustered and it looks much better compared to our first simple randomizers which would just spread them evenly, randomly. Uh, of course, uh, even for the areas where the features like vegetation or stones occur in lower densities, not covering, not covering the whole area, but occurring in some pattern, we are doing the clusterization. One of the clusters is highlighted. We are even capable of uh, assigning uh, various uh, vegetation to the boundaries of the cluster and to the center. So this also resembles the real-life occurrence of the tundra. It's part of our another experimental terrain uh, where we were trying to uh, do some purely natural landscape uh, using very rough data and uh, some algorithms we were developing for the terrain processor. Uh, we can fill not just forests. There are also plenty of tree lines and vegetation lines in the landscape. And we can do that too. So this is the same area in the game. Some alleys along the roads, uh, some forest lines or tree lines uh, on the background. It works and it's, and it's really fast to edit them. And of course, even in case of lines, we are able to cl cluster the features, in this case the birch trees, so that they resemble the real life clusters. Nature really loves clustering because uh, when the birches started growing there, it was just one birch and it was spreading in the line where it was allowed. But it's not just the vegetation. We are using our tools and the geographic data to uh, fill in our landscapes with things like verge poles or power lines. 40 kilometers doesn't sound like much, but again, 30 meters wire segment. And that would be quite a job for somebody. So uh, instead of focusing on uh, the power lines themselves, our designers can make such a nice, detailed uh, locations, alleys, backyards. Uh, this screenshot, uh, screenshot is from the Tanoa terrain for Arma 3 Apex. But uh, as we like wine, and uh, uh, as we liked working on Malden, adding various interesting features, we even developed uh, the vineyard generator. We started with these polygons. There were like more than 100 of those on Malden. And uh, although it wasn't a big chunk of land, we wanted one specific pattern. So we developed a little module generating these complete vineyards consisting of the fence model and, uh, uh, and the vegetation. But uh, we are going further. Uh, and we recently started experimenting with Houdini. So this is one of our villages. That reddish uh, on, on the background is uh, the original vector of the urbanized area from the data set we obtained. And the blue, is, it's a buffer of this layer uh, within the 50 meters distance. Uh, following screenshots just contain something which is complete mambo jumbo to me, except that I slightly understand the rules, but uh, those of you familiar with Houdini would immediately spot that we are, may well, maybe you won't spot it, but we are using the uh, bullet-powered physical simulation of uh, buildings sticking to, uh, to the road network in the given area, and uh, then we are filtering some out. Re resulting blocks are visualized in Houdini and can be translated to the game as well. Of course, those of you who know our games and the attention to detail we pay to the urbanized areas would say like, what the hell is this? It's simple, it's the first iteration, it's the prototype. It's important for us to have at least some buildings to start prototyping the gameplay. So, to conclude my presentation, uh, 
the primary uh, use of geographic data or my key reason to do that is that we are drawing features of the real landscape that we are borrowing from nature. Uh, if you use a chunk of a real landscape for a game which features some open world like our games, uh, you just add the details you wouldn't figure out by yourself. Like you can employ hundreds of designers and they won't be able to compete with the nature and with the human civilization which both has been influencing current landscapes for ages, million years to hundred years or decades, be it like that. You, you simply cannot uh, do much better if you are after authentic landscape. Besides this, like getting the en environments we really need, we have big advantage of quick pre-production. The steps I was showing you lead to very rough prototypes, but these rough prototypes are already usable in game. So within the scale of our playable content, our scenarios, it's, it's perfect. We don't need to micromanage particular AIs covering behind some corner, jumping on player, no. Because in our games, the player can approach the village from a completely different angle. But uh, that's fine. We already have a prototype of landscape where our designers and first players can maneuver like that. Uh, of course, uh, it also makes our production a lot easier. So, uh, thanks to this, we are able to do a lot of terrains in a very small amount of people. Like, average number of terrain designers is usually around five, may range from two to ten. Usually one of the guys, maybe the one on the left, uh, he's the guy who's doing the GIS work, the guy who's managing the geographic data and servicing the map. And it results in quite a huge but very detailed authentic landscapes we were so far able to provide to players as part of our Arma franchise. And what's most important, designers don't need to do the dirty work they can focus on something which is really, truly important. Like in Argo on the screenshot, they can polish the landscape for the players, they can do the finishing touches, they can invent content, they can focus on designing, and that's the most important. Well, thank you for your attention. If you are interested in the topic, or uh, if you just want to say hi, please use this email. You can follow me on Twitter. I'm mostly posting there some nice landscape pictures. As a game dev, I'm pretty useless in this, so don't expect much of the pro tips. I don't have, I don't have any. And I guess now it's the time for your questions. So thanks for your attention. Hi, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I have two questions, and they are quite similar. Uh, if you are using uh, the ID maps, like the splat maps, uh, how do you handle you know, the, the, the blending between, uh, if you blend like uh, grass terrain and mud terrain, it, it's uh, quite natural. It could be like use the blending. But, but if, you, if you try to blend, uh, for example, asphalt or something, uh, some, some hard rock or some, something harder, with uh, with mud or with uh, grass, how do you avoid this um, feeling that it's uh, you can see that it's like half transparent yeah. over them? And it, yeah. It's well, unfortunately, our engine uh, we are using for uh, Arma at the moment doesn't support any nice way of blending surfaces. Uh, so uh, it's very it's very simple gradient based transition. Uh, uh, but uh, we can do a lot uh, with the data themselves. So, for example, the bump maps and, uh, and general tones and patterns are designed in a way that uh, you don't mind that much. Also, we are trying to uh, uh, obviously fix stuff which looks weird and also draw 
your attention towards the huge landscape, towards the nice views, so that you don't walk around looking at the edge of the grass surface, nitpicking. Yeah, it was great, great answer, thank you. <laughs> You're uh, and the other one was, uh, when, you, when we were talking about uh, the trees, the generation of the trees, uh, I understand that uh, if you have the, the ID map, uh, you can easily generate you know, the big chunks or the big fields of, of uh, some foliage. But if you are trying to do the straight line like the Addis or place some, uh, you know, like the si single, single tree in next to the building, it's, it's probably easier to make it, like, uh, place it handle by, by hand. Yes, of course. But uh, do they, like, uh, in some, some engines like Unity, for sure, I don't know about Unreal, uh, if you place it by hand, it's, uh, it's not cooperating with the, with the automatic placing. Well, uh, it's slightly different with us, obviously. Uh, what I was showcasing here is the way to get the rough stuff done. It does not cover the manual work. So, uh, uh, our designers spend a lot of time manually polishing the terrains. Uh, they use uh, the in-game orthophotography for the reference a lot, because again, it's a footprint of the content which belongs there, which is there for some reason. So they are doing the manual changes, that's for sure. Uh, and our tools um, work uh, with the layers of objects. And what you import from uh, the terrain processor, in our case, it's just one of the many layers, and you can still edit individual trees. Of course, once you do that, you are investing some work, which if you would like to change it, must be cancelled, thrown away, you are regenerating. So we are trying to generate uh, our content, uh, which is based on geodata, uh, to a degree when we are happy with that. And once we are happy with that, we only commence the manual editing. And we, of course, we can keep the layers separated. We can even uh, assign locations where there will be no generated content. It can be marked, and uh, uh, we can then unleash someone to create some nice location in the middle of the forest because we have left out a nice square for, for him. So uh, definitely in our tools we support uh, this equal editing of all the features which are getting there. Okay, cool, thank you. You're welcome. Any, any other questions? Anyone? Okay, I, I think I, I have a question. Uh, my question is, so does that mean that you use the data and then bake it all and you have the map like pre-built or is it generated when you load the game? Uh, it's, uh, uh, it's static data. Uh, so we are generating everything offline, we put it into the tools and we produce data which then have to be binarized and mastered and then they are only put in the game. So uh, it's no just seeding stuff and, uh, and, and generating terrains on the fly. I remember when I started working for Bohemia Interactive in 2006, uh, uh, the guys were developing so-called Game 2, and uh, uh, Jan Hovora, who is author of our system for creating tree models, which was using the mathematical model for the tree growing. Uh, his original plan with this tool was to just generate trees in the real time and uh, uh, you know, uh, have ver various models according to the uh, insulation, you know, how, how much light goes to that location, how much shadow is cast by other trees. It all sounded brilliant. If you had like three or five trees, it worked. And we used the tool very successfully to create uh, the models for Arma 2, for instance. But uh, obviously, uh, uh, such a complicated task in such a huge scale was impossible to do. So, uh, like everything is done before, everything's prepared. And only thanks to these preparations, uh, our engine can support such a huge view distance, such big amount of uh, object instances, 
and such a scale. Any more questions? If not, I will thank you. Uh, You're welcome. <laughs> so thanks for your attention.